Okay. Well, hi everyone. We are so thrilled to have Dr. Sue Johnson with us this morning. And as I'm sure you're all aware, she's an author, a clinical psychologist, a researcher, and a leading innovator in the field of couple therapy and adult attachment. So Sue is the primary developer of Emotionally Focused Therapy, EFT, and she is the director of the International Center for Excellence in EFT. She's a distinguished research professor at Alliant University in San Diego, California, as well as Professor Emeritus at the University of Ottawa, Canada. Sue's latest book, Attachment Theory and Practice, EFT with Individuals, Couples and Families, shows the promise of attachment science in making sense of and repairing our most precious relationships and thriving as strong and resilient individuals. So we are just so honoured to have her open this assembly for us. So welcome and over to you, Sue. Hey, thank you so much. It's nice to be here. It's a little strange in that I'm not actually there. I'm on the other side of the, the universe, um, on the west coast of Canada. So and we've been hearing about um, your country and Australia and the difficulties you've been having. So it's nice to be with you. And um, what I'm going to talk about is um, attachment science and psychotherapy. And I'll talk for about an hour. And then I think we've decided that I'll, I'll stop. And um, folks can uh, prepare a couple of questions and I'll see if I can answer a couple of questions. So um, a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is really captured in my book that came out last year, um, Attachment Science in Practice, um, em um, Emotionally Focused Therapy with Individuals, Couples and Families. And um, the, the reason that that book was so important for me was because, as most of you will probably know, um, EFT has for quite a long time been one of the leading interventions for couples and um, ha has also been used very obviously with families, but has been one of the leading interventions for couples on this planet. Um, it's now the gold standard for research in the field of um, couple therapy and it's very well systematized in terms of interventions. There's over 20 outcome studies. Um, and I think it's really brought a lot to the field in terms of working with people's strongest emotions in a way that makes them feel more balanced and more able to change, um, documenting key change events that really seem to create change after therapy and also at follow-up years later. And also um, talking about how useful it is to see couple relationships from an attachment point of view. Um, so that has been going on in the couples field for 30 years. Um, but really what's happening now is that we're starting to own the fact, and this new book that came out last year is starting to own the fact that we're not just couples therapists, even if we could say we're very good couples therapists because we think we are. <laughs> but um, we're not just couples therapists that train people all over the world and create educational programs. We're very proud of our work in couples, but we're actually, in the end, we're attachment orientated experiential therapists. So um, the EFT model stands, grounds itself in attachment science, grounds itself in the attachment science version of who we are as human beings, what our deepest vulnerabilities are, what our deepest needs are, and grounds us in it really EFT is grounded in that attachment science and at the same time in terms of intervention it brings in all the wisdom from systems theory that looks at relationship patterns and how they define us as human beings and all the wisdom from experiential therapy people like Rogers and with that comes um, really a focus on the power of emotion the power of emotion either to keep us blocked or the power of emotion to create change. So this new, um, if you like, focus in emotionally focused therapy really says we're attachment experiential therapists and it doesn't really matter about modality. It doesn't matter who you have in the room. You can do 
powerful attachment oriented experiential therapy that uses the power of emotion whether you have an individual sitting in your office who's dealing with depression and anxiety or PTSD um, and you know who has a very negative sense of self doesn't have any emotional balance cannot regulate their emotions and cannot create positive relationships in their life to support them or you can um, work with a very distressed couple and use this map to change this map of who we are as human beings in the same way uh, attachment really gives us a map to people's inner lives and their relational lives a map that's very practical that you can use in therapy a map that helps me tune in to every person i see whether it's an individual or a person in a couple locked in a terrible negative cycle or um, a, a dad in a family who you know the issue in the family has always been that the kid has an anger problem then when you start doing EFFT you suddenly see when you take an attachment orientated approach and you look at the emotional signals flying backwards and forth you suddenly see that the real problem in the family is yes the kid is very angry and what is that about the kid is very angry and desperately trying to get his father to respond to him and his father cannot respond to him and this is what triggers the family into meltdown into chaos creates rage and depression in the kid has the mother on anxiety um, pills and um, has the father in shutdown and helpless numbing so what we're talking about here is that eft is um, tells us what to do in individual couple and family therapy because it's based on the attachment map of who we are as human beings when i say that to you it's kind of funny when you really think about it that the way the whole field of psychotherapy has developed has been kind of random and hickledy pickledy depending on what theorist was most popular at the time or who did a, a interesting piece of research it hasn't been based on a clear broad biological understanding of who we are as human beings it has not been based on a clear developmental rich broad theory of personality and that theory also if it's good also isn't just focused on personality as me in my skin it's focused on personality a la how i interact with other people because what attachment tells us is we are social bonding beings so that's like you know fish live in water we live in our relationships our relationships create our inner world our emotional world our sense of self right and ongoingly our relationships support us to go out and engage with the world or teach us that we are alone and ultimately vulnerable and make it impossible for us to engage with our world in any kind of open way so we have not based the field of psychotherapy <laughs> on a clear understanding of who we are which is a bit like you know medicine many centuries ago was based on all kinds of abstract concepts it wasn't based on the actual structure of the human body <laughs> so when you think about that it's kind of funny you know and the word structure is interesting because if you go into attachment science what you understand is that there is an innate organic structure to how we deal with our emotions how we engage others how we shape our, our sense of self um, there's an innate organic structure to our emotions, to our emotional life. There's an innate organic structure to the patterns of interaction we create with other people that then feed back into that emotional life, just as the way we put our emotions together feeds into the signals we send to others and sets up our interpersonal world. And this is something that is really essential to attachment, which also hasn't really been clear in the field of psychotherapy the field of psychotherapy has basically been based on looking at a human being as if you end at your skin and hasn't really considered our emotional our nervous system and how tuned in in it is to signals from other people it's been based on individualism 
you know, us seeing being individuals, it has often it's ignored the interpersonal element of our lives. So what I'm really saying now is, um, and in this new book, is what I'm saying is, um, if we want a coherent discipline of psychotherapy, and I think we need to uh, really look at what I'm saying there because um, many people in our society would never see a therapist, would never come to a therapist. And many young people that I talk to would prefer to go to an app to get a simple little app, a simple little, would go on the internet and listen to a guru or would go to their uh, GP and go on drugs. So, you know, talk therapy um, hasn't always had a great, re great reputation. <laughs> and a, a lot of people out there who are desperately trying to help people do not really have a map for how to do it. So there's a lot of evidence that um, we need uh, people have been talking for years, actually, about how we need to integrate the field of psychotherapy. We need to create order and coherence. Trouble is, um, nobody's really known how to do it. <laughs> so, you know, I remember as a graduate student going to conferences where everyone would stand up and make these enormous pompous speeches about how we were going to integrate the field of psychotherapy. And then you look decades later and it's in chaos. If you think of the field of psychotherapy just for a minute, there are more and more interventions, often called by different names, but the same interventions, which is a little confusing. There are more and more models of therapy, which are all territorial and fighting each other and taking it often a tiny little piece of functioning like cognition or behavior in a particular context, right? Or a particular skill and just focusing on that. There's more and more disorders. I think the field in, um, in North America has finally rebelled against the continuing list of disorders put out by the DSM committee. Finally, we seem to have stood up and said, this is so silly, we can't even pretend to agree with it anymore. <laughs> if you look, I mean, if you can imagine that this was medicine instead of you know, thinking about our mental life and our emotional life, we'd be appalled, you know, if you look at the field of psychotherapy, there's um, thousands of names for interventions. There's over 400 um, formulated models, most of which need um, quite a lot of attention and learning in order to become in any way expert on, in them, right? And there's huge manuals and there's research studies and all the research studies are looking at proving that this particular intervention works for a very particular part of the population, the ones that you never see in your office. You know, because what comes into your office are people with who say, yes, I'm anxious. Oh, by the way, I'm depressed. And also, by the way, I have an eating disorder and I'm addicted. I'm thinking of my client that I just did a training tape on. And by the way, I'm addicted to gambling. Oh, and also I can't stand sex and I'm a terribly bad parent. <laughs> so these are the people that come into my office but sometimes you look at the studies and they're all clean and neat and you know they're just folks that have agreed on a questionnaire to come in and do look at one little piece of themselves right so um it's chaos out there and um more and more disorders more and more interventions and young therapists come up to me we train all over the world and I had one lady in New York who just burst into tears and said, you know, the more I'm reading and the more conferences I go to, the more confused I get. I'm, I don't know whether I should do CBT, AEDP, EFT, uh, you know, uh, IFS. I mean, listen to all these acronyms. You know, um, I, I'm so confused. And, she, and I don't even know how relationships would be to talk to my couples. I don't know whether I should be telling them all to have open relationships or whether that's a bad idea or whether I should tell them, oh, if you're not getting along, get divorced or whether I should teach them communication skills. I just felt like taking her in my arms, right? What I actually said, <laughs> I did express sympathy. What I actually said is I hear you and 
for me, I have to ground myself to do good psychotherapy. And what we try to teach people to do is to stand in the ground of attachment science. And because that can order this chaos and it can bring coherence to this and it can help you understand who we are as human beings, how things go wrong, how we get stuck, you know, in ways of dealing with our emotions, ways of seeing other people, ways of dancing with other people, and what we need to get unstuck, and even what health looks like. This is the other issue. You know, in a field, you've got to be able to identify health. You know, medicine used to identify health as, well, a lack of symptoms. I don't think that's true anymore. I think the world is looking at, no, it's not just a lack of symptoms. Health is something proactive it's about thriving right and i think we need the same in men in mental health so from my point of view we desperately need um a core understanding of who we are as human beings and a map for working with human beings and i um from where I am anyway, uh, you know, I remember writing the book and thinking this is such a big thing to say. Maybe I shouldn't even say it. Maybe it's a bit pretentious. But if it is pretentious, that's fine. Because we have 30 years of, of evidence and research working with very distressed couples that have taught us this. And there are thousands of studies on attachment at this point and hundreds of studies on adult attachment, which has only really been looked at in the last couple of years. So it might be, uh, it's a rather big thing to say, but I'm gonna say it, that the answer to all this chaos is a clear, broad, massively researched, rich, relational, developmental theory of personality that is practical enough for therapists to use. And there is only one, which is, makes it easier. <laughs> uh, there is only one. And that's attachment. And um, it's interesting to me how um, for years and years and years, um, adult attachment was kind of in the weeds. People would say, no, no, attachment's about infants and parents. Um, adults, something happens with adults, they reach their 12th birthday and suddenly they become these massively independent, self-sufficient little beings. And we, I think we really believe that. I think there's lots of people in the world who still believe that. That's the way we should be, right? And over the last two decades only, we forget it's only been two decades. It's been two decades since I would stand up at conferences and start talking about attachment and everyone would leave the room, <laughs> which is a bit demoralizing. Uh, and now, when nobody leaves the room, people actually take notes when I start talking about adult attachment and right, but it's taken a while because our societies, our developed societies in particular, have been very caught up with individualism, very caught up with the, and not only that, but the idea of the rugged individual, the individual who can face the world alone. Look at all our uh, movies, you know, look at the Terminator, look at the, the, no, the Terminator is the one where he actually climbs into a machine, I think. Um, actually, there's the Terminator. People do actually, um, the, the machines, the, the, the heroes inside the machines actually talk to each other and help each other. But I'm thinking of the old ones where you had one, one dude, you know, with a big square jaw going out and, you know, fighting Godzilla. And my God, he won. Of course he did, you know, because this was the image we had of human beings. So um, that has taken a while to change and there's still resistance to that. But I want to give you um, a sense of where we've come from people walking out every time I started to talk about adult attachment. We are now at the place where massively macho institutions like the US Army are now, um, right now, training all their chaplains in emotionally focused therapy and training their chaplains to give the education program that we created from our work in EFT and from an attachment perspective, um, the education program uh, called Created for Connection, you probably know it as Hold Me Tight, 
right, whatever you call it, um, these chaplains are now teaching all these men in the army. I think um, it's now up to 5,000 men. They just started doing this this year. 5,000, um, it's not just men, there's women warriors, 5,000 military personnel have received this training. And the military will actually say to me, and now it's happening in the Canadian military too, we understand. We understand that it's been a mistake to just treat the soldier as a warrior and you know, not ignore the context that soldier lives in, which is he leaves his family to go away and fight. He comes back to his family. And if his family are not intact and he cannot connect, reconnect with that family, then he's much more likely to develop PTSD. He's much more likely to commit suicide. And so even very powerful macho organizations are start to understand that we have seen human beings in a very sort of simple, compartmentalized way, and that we need to take account of the fact that we need relationships like fish need water. When you take a fish out of the water, it doesn't function very well. It just doesn't. Our ecological niche are it, our, our social relationships and particularly our bonding relationships. That's where we can define ourselves as competent, as worthwhile, and be confident going out into the world. That's where we feel worthy or not worthy, right? So the, our understanding of human beings is changing and growing. And this has so much to do with John Bowlby. Um, and if you think about that, it's quite amazing. He's a, he was a small, rather reserved, rather uptight, aristocratic Englishman who got the strange idea that relationships really mattered. <laughs> and he was brought up in English boarding school. Um, his, mother, his relationships with his parents sound very distant indeed. You know, his mother invited him when he was 12 years old. She said that he could now, since he was becoming an adult, feel free to come after, after dinner into the drawing room after dinner and to talk with them for a few minutes, right? So you can imagine, it's rather strange. Um, human beings are so creative, sometimes we actually find the truth in the absence of what we have, right? John Bowlby was brought up by nannies. And most of the time when his mother realized he was getting attached to a nanny, he'd fire her. She'd fire her. So um, perhaps this man listened to his own pain. Perhaps this man felt inside what we now know from science, which is if you want somebody to um, lose their sense of self, not be able to cope and disappear into mental illness, it, the recipe is really simple. You isolate them. You cut them off from other people. Loneliness kills us. Uh, this is not, I'm talking on a biological level now. Louise Hawkley talks about the fact that Emotional isolation, if you report emotional isolation, you're two to three times more likely to have heart attack and stroke, and you're less likely to recover from that. So we have so much evidence now of who we are, evidence that wasn't around two decades ago. And really what I'm trying to say in this talk and in the, and the book I wrote is that we must listen to this. We must listen to this as mental health professionals. This is gold for us. Right, this is gold. It is true, however, that John Bowlby only had one lifetime. <laughs> and if you think what he did with it, it was quite amazing. Okay. Um, but he only had one lifetime. So what he didn't have time to do, he wanted his work to be used clinically. But what he didn't have time to do is tell us exactly how to do that. <laughs> so in EFT, in a way, we filled in the blanks. We We've looked at the fact that if Carl Rogers and John Bowlby had met together, I can't see how they wouldn't have adored each other. They say so many things that are the same. You know, uh, John Bowlby said, if you understand people from an attachment point of view, everything they do, even the most self-destructive, apparently irrational things are perfectly reasonable. If you understand the pain they're in, and the fact that they only have so many ways of dealing with that pain. And sometimes that ends up being a way that keeps them stuck 
So their protection from that pain then becomes a prison in the rest of their life. If you understand that, then you can empathize with people stuck places. You don't judge, you don't categorize them. You look at them as human beings struggling with their vulnerabilities, just like all of us do. You understand those vulnerabilities. You know, I mean, Bowlby believed this and Rogers believed this. Rogers believed that what therapy was about was not just addressing some symptoms and helping them contain them. It was about growing people, growing people into the ability to be real, really alive and to thrive. Bowlby would have put it, growing people into a sense of security in the world, that other people are there for them, that they belong in the world, that they're lovable, right? So these two men, I think would have really got along and Rogers would have been able to say to Bowlby, I listen to you and I listen to how you say emotion is so important. We've ignored emotion in human functioning. We talk about the brain, cognition, behavior, right? We forget how emotion is an amazingly dominating, defining factor in how we put our sense of self together, how we connect with other people, how we frame our world, right? The most basic thing you have to do as a human being is deal with your innate vulnerability. And there are only so many ways to do that. And, you know, basically this is kind of what attachment helps us see, right? And it, and it translates into what I talk about in EFT is, I believe that EFT is on target. It helps us understand the defining variables that really matter in health and in dysfunction and focus down on those and start to shift those. After all, you can create lots of changes in psychotherapy and they'll be peripheral to what's really going on in somebody's life, right? But Bowlby created the big view, the understanding of personality and, and people's needs and Rogers came along and agreed with that view and then said, right, so what you have to do is join people. Bobby would have said, yes, connection makes people feel safe. Then they can explore their world, right? So you know, Rogers came along and said, what you've got to do, he turned all the precepts of attachment into clinically relevant interventions. He said, then you've got to join with people, not judge them. You've got to tune into them. You've got to help them do what a good parent does, which is stand beside a child and help them understand and tune into their world. There's no point in judging them, right? You've got to go with them and move them into their emotional lives and move them through that emotion. So it's a shame those two people um, hadn't, didn't meet. I think if they had have, maybe they would have made our job much easier. <laughs> but nevertheless, what I'm talking about here is we are Rogerian humanistic experimental approach, experimental approach to therapy. And we believe that EFT epitomizes what John Bowlby would have wanted in terms of an attachment orientated approach to psychotherapy, individual, couple and family. So what we're, what we're talking about these days is you can, doesn't matter whether you're doing EFIT, emotionally focused individual therapy or EFT for couples addressing healing a distressed relationship so it becomes a place where both people can grow and thrive or EFT, E-F-F-T, right? um, which is emotionally focused family therapy. It doesn't matter what you're doing um, if you take an attachment frame and you accept that EFT has worked in that frame for years and epitomizes that frame, we have a new way forward. We have a way home in psychotherapy. So for me, this is, um, this is kind of what I was searching for as a graduate student. This is what I would be, you know, I'd go to conferences like a crazy little weird red-headed crazy student and stand up and ask very rude questions in <laughs> in talks um which you know i was relatively unpleasant i think in those days because i was on fire i wanted to understand and nobody could really tell me you know what made people tick and why couples had such horrible relationships and what people's pain was all about and 
somehow I just couldn't handle the fact that I couldn't understand. So um, for me, it feels like suddenly things are coming together. And when I watch uh, us teach uh, health professionals all over the world in our externships and um, just in the talks we give, no matter what modality we're teaching, I see the need, the hunger in health professionals to understand their clients, to understand us as human beings, to be able to engage with those people, to have a clear way of seeing those people, to know, have systematic interventions that they can use with these people that create change in every session. Um, I see, I see this hunger, right? And I see when we do our trainings, um, the shift in therapist sense of self. Now, we've actually done two research projects on this. We, we research everything in EFT, we're a bit crazy. So, um, you know, there's actually two beautiful research projects that came out in the, the Journal of Marriage and Family Therapy that talks about um, what happens to people who do our four day externships all over the world? What happens to therapists? And it was very fascinating because people reported, well, I feel more confident and competent with my couples, right? I feel more confident and competent with my clients, whoever they are, right? because most therapists don't just see couples, they see individuals and sometimes families, but they also reported, which was very neat, that also I feel like it's grown me as a person. That's right. Because you know, psychology is the understanding of the psyche and, and attachment gives us a way of understanding our own vulnerabilities, our own needs, the, our own ways of getting stuck in our relationships. So this has amazing promise for us, amazing promise for us in the field of psychotherapy, amazing promise for us as human beings. In uh, a book I wrote for the public a few years ago, Love Sense, in the last chapter in that book, I talk about civilization and say, you know, what is it? You know, um, there's a lovely story about Mahatma Gandhi going um, to England and somebody say, asking him what he thought of English civilization. And Mahatma Gandhi said he thought it would be a very good idea. <laughs> so the question is, what is civilization? So civilization for me is a society that recognizes on a, in a very deep way who we are as human beings and what our needs are and structures a safe society where we can get those needs met, where we can thrive and grow and find our own potential and take care of this planet, right? So um, what I'm really saying is um, this understanding of who we are um, can lead us forward in more ways just than in psychotherapy. Having said all this, and I was going to be incredibly disciplined and look at all my slides and tell you it all incredibly in a disciplined way, and I haven't done that. <laughs> Somehow I just start talking to you. So let me get a bit more disciplined here because otherwise it'll be question time and we won't have covered enough. So if you say, okay what we need is a clear scientific view of who we are that's uh, attachment offers as that eft is based <coughs> on attachment if you take let's look for basic principles what are the basic principles that attachment excuse me a minute <coughs> what are the basic principles that attachment puts out that guide the therapist well the first basic principle of all is the incredible primacy of affect the incredible primacy of emotion Bowlby talks about it all the time but he only tells us in a few clinical stories in his work how he would deal with it right and I think in those clinical stories um, if Rogers met the, uh, listened to those clinical stories <coughs> He would resonate with them. So, Bobby, for example, talks about how if you're talking to a widow who is enraged uh, at the death of her partner, you know, um, the thing to do is to accept her rage. The thing to do is to resonate with that rage 
to hear that rage, to find the logic in that rage, not to try and persuade her that that's irrational or that there's something wrong with her for feeling this rage. You join with your client and then you and your client walk forward, right? You can walk through the emotion, you make sense of the emotion, you order it and it changes and you and your client can start to explore and move somewhere else. This is um, different in itself from any of the approaches to psychotherapy, which are very much based on, you have a symptom, a dysfunction, let me give you three skilled ways out of that. Let me ha help you contain that emotion better. Let me uh, tell you what to do when you have this symptom so that it isn't quite so front and center in your life. There's nothing wrong with that per se. I just want us to ask ourselves in psychotherapy if it's enough. If it's enough. You know, if you went to a doctor and he said, well, I don't know why you, you're unhappy and I don't know what's going to happen in the future and I can't make you feel good, but I'll help you get rid of this symptom for a little while. You'd say, doc, you know what? That's not really, <laughs> that's not really what I came here for, right? So, so really what we're talking about here is helping people create emotional balance, which is what secure attachment gives you, and we can see this in all the hundreds and hundreds of studies between mothers and infants, helping people create this emotional balance. When you have your emotional balance, you can choose how to move in your life. When you think about yourself, when you deal with yourself, when you deal with others, when you make decisions, you can choose how to move. If you have no emotional balance, you're always falling you're always falling into trying to shut your emotions down and avoid, or you're falling into getting more and more aroused, acting out your emotions, getting reactive, right? So really what we're talking about here is that attachment tells us about the primacy of emotion, how important it is, that it's a high level information processing system that we use to color our world, to tell ourselves what's important, to orientate ourselves, and it's the way we signal to other people, engage with other people or not, right? So it tells us how important it is. And it tells us something about how to deal with it, that you, you can't just try to suppress it or cope with it, that there's something about make, understanding emotion, the logic and the structure of emotion and making sense of it, and then helping people move into it and engage with it differently. And in EFT, we talk about assembling emotion and deepening emotion and actually you, not just helping people move into emotional balance, but knowing how to use the momentum behind emotion to create change. In EFT, we talk about corrective emotional experiences. And this is another big debate in psychotherapy. You know, in the end, what really creates lasting change? and we could debate this for a long time but there's lots of evidence to say that um, you can't really do much better if you look at recent research than the old concept of a corrective emotional experience which has been around for a long time that you know you can give people new ideas you can teach them some skills um, the tricky part about skills is if they lose their emotional balance they're probably not going to be able to use those skills when they need them the most but there's lots of ways in to create change, right? But what attachment says and experiential therapy says and EFT says is to create lasting change, you need a corrective emotional experience. And um, it's interesting when you look at psychotherapy from that lens, you know, how many therapy models really have a very clear way of understanding emotion, understanding how important it is, and dealing with it in a way that orders it, and makes it whole. You know, it's, it seems to me that attachment tells us that in psychotherapy, we have to stop seeing emotion as the enemy, as something to control and contain and start seeing it as a powerful response that we need to make friends with, befriend, and then use to create change. Bowlby pointed out, and I think Rogers would have loved this, that in the end, under any, under any, clinical problem, there are frightening, alien, and unacceptable emotions. 
frightening, alien, and unacceptable. The word that hits me there is alien, because I see so many clients who've seen other therapists and who've been given all kinds of labels for what they're going through and how, how stuck they are. And a lot of times what I see is that they're in a world that just doesn't make sense to them. They don't know how to make sense of their inner world. They don't know how to make sense of the um, world of relationships. So, you know, when I'm doing family therapy and little Jacob is uh, in, in family therapy because he's taking the house apart. He's only 11, but he's enraged. He's taking the house apart. And the, the family agree that he's the problem, right? What I see is that when the family dance gets going, it's the complete shutdown and numbing out of the father. That's the problem. And the mother and the child are creating all this chaos to somehow get some engagement from the father. And if you go in and you talk to the father and he's been given lots of skills to deal with his son, none of which are working, okay, because everybody's off balance in the family. And when you talk to the father and you listen to him, and you say, what's happening to you is your son turns and reaches out for you. And that's an experiential, what's happening for you, right? What is happening right here, right? That's an experiential question. And the father looks at you and there's panic in his eyes. And I say in a soft voice, my sense is you just don't know what to do. And he says, I don't know how to be a dad. I don't know what to do when he reaches for me. And suddenly I have enormous empathy for this man who's telling me, being a father is an alien experience to me. Responding to the look of desperation in my child's face is alien to me. This is a strange alien world where I don't belong and I don't know what to do and I feel incompetent. Ah. Then when I see him that way, I can tune into him that way. I know what to do. I go in and I support him. And I'm going to talk to you in a minute about something called the EFT Tango, where I'll tell you exactly the structure I use to support him. But I go in and I talk to him. And the first thing I do is help him see what's going on in his experience and have him look into my eyes. And he sees, um, I say, this must be so hard for you to want to be a good dad and to feel like you don't know the dance, you don't understand the music, you don't know what's going on, you don't know how to do this. He said, I never had a dad. I said, I understand, this is so hard for you. And this man who's numbed out and, and absent and never comes home, weeps. And his wife looks at him like she's never seen him before. And he says, you're the first person that's ever seen that. Huh? So I have an attachment orientated map. I have a map to people's emotions, a map to their vulnerabilities, a map to their needs. And this empowers me, it gives me confidence as a therapist, right? So, you know, in our, in our trainings, we do live sessions where people we've never met before, the therapist tells us a little bit about them, you know, and we sit and we're taped and people are watching us, which is kind of intimidating. And we do live sessions with people we've never seen before. Distressed couples, families, individuals, right? And people sometimes say to me, how can you do that? Well, I couldn't do it just as me. I couldn't do it without this attachment understanding, this map to who we are, without understanding about emotion. I couldn't do it, right? So. Bowlby and Rogers both said, emotion matters. The key issue in, in most problems you're gonna see in your office is emotion regulation. How people are either overwhelmed by or numbed out and, and are alien to their own emotional life. The second thing that attachment tells us is, if you're gonna do good psychotherapy, you've got to have a really special kind of alliance. And there's lots of general stuff being said about the general variable of the therapeutic alliance and how it's a general variable. So I'm gonna say, I don't think it's a general variable in psychotherapy. 
because it varies wildly across depending what model you're using. An EFT therapist does not have the same kind of alliance as an average, say, CBT -er who's teaching somebody how to monitor their and put their, their symptoms on a scale of one to 10. It's a different alliance. One's a coach, right? I'm not a coach. I go in as Sue and meet another human being. So in the alliance, we say, if you're a good attachment oriented therapist and a good eft -er, you go in and you create A-R-E. You, you create accessibility, responsiveness, and engagement. That's what a good bond looks like. That, they are the, that's the definition of a good bond. A mother and a good mother is accessible, responsive, and engaged with her child, right? A good therapist, if you're an EFT therapist, you are emotionally accessible, open, attuned, connected. You are engaged. You are there for your client. You are curious. You, you follow them. Even when you don't understand their experience, you follow them, right? You are engaged with them. You are responsive. So when a woman comes into my office and says, I don't want to be here because I've got, a, I've given birth to a disabled child and you're going to tell me what every other therapist has told me, which is basically suck it up and cope and give me all kinds of coping skills. And I don't want to be here because that's what you're going to tell me. And I sit and I say, how do you feel as you talk about your child? She says, I'm enraged. I'm angry. And you're going to try and persuade me not to be angry. So my job is to join her in her rage. My job is to understand her rage and say, of course, you're angry. You feel cheated. So I took all the tests. The tests were all negative. This wasn't supposed to happen. I'm not the kind of person that has a disabled child. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to give the child up. I say, yes, I hear you. You're telling life. You can't do this to me. I won't let you. You feel so out of control and she weeps. So we have a special kind of alliance. The other thing about attachment, it says good psychotherapy, you have to focus within at how the person's creating their emotional life and how those emotions access models of self and models of other. They access and prioritize certain cognitions. And you have to focus between how people interact with other people. And you have to do both. And that, again, is different from many models of psychotherapy, where you just do one or the other. Mm -hmm. Where you just focus on, you know, you go for family therapy and, and it's all about what's happening in the family, or you go for individual therapy and the, 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 the person talks to you about your depression and how it comes from your childhood. But there's no asking about what are your relationships like now. Right. The other thing that attachment does is it gives us a way of being with people that understands how people get stuck in certain ways of dealing with their emotions and they only have so many ways of coping with that and they get caught in rigid ways of being seeing themselves being with other people and it gives us a, a goal a destination it gives us a model of health now, i don't just want my clients to tell me i'm less depressed that's not enough for me I want my clients, what did my lady say to me the other day? Very traumatized lady. I said, you come in here and you talk to me. I've had maybe 12 sessions with her. You talk to me. It must be so difficult for you to come in here because you don't want to touch these, these memories and you don't, it's, you, you can't bear, you know, you can only talk about them from a distant point of view and you don't want to touch them. And you gave me a drawing the other day and it was a drawing of one of the, where the places where this trauma happened and it was just of the building. You didn't put any people in it. So there was a lot missing from this drawing. This is so difficult for you. What's it like to come into therapy? And she says, it's exhilarating. I said, you're kidding. <laughs> she said, no, cause I feel like you're not scared of how I feel and you're not you and you and you're whatever I say to you 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 hear me and you help me with it and you help me make sense of things and so suddenly I have hope and I feel like I'm I can grow 
and and I do what I often do in 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 whatever model whatever modality I'm using. I've created an image uh, with her of her resilient self, and I say, "Oh, could you help me?" Moments in here, it's hard, but other moments, you remember what it was like when you were 12 years old on that balance beam, when you did a perfect, perfect, perfect whatever it was, a curl in the air, right? And you landed and you said to yourself, I'm full of energy, I'm light, I can fly. And she laughs and she says, yes, I can fly. It hurts in here, but at the end of the session, I can fly. So we have a sense of health. We have a sense of, if you go and look at what secure attachment looks like in all the research studies, secure attachment, right, which is associated with the ability to deal with ambiguity, the ability to deal with stress, resilience, feeling good about yourself, engaging with other people. It's secure attachment predicts every variable known to man that predicts thriving, okay? We have a model of health, we know where we're going. The other thing that attachment tells us to do is to stay with our client and not get lost in abstractions, but to stay focused on present process. You know, John Bowlby, he, his, all his ideas were really um, solidified by looking at how a mother and a child interacted in a research project called The Strange Situation, okay? He didn't say, oh, I got all these ideas, let's just write them down and then play with them forever. Right? He said, let's take these ideas and look at how they turn up in the immediate experience in present process in the drama that I can see in front of me the strange situation. And you've got a mother and an infant, they come in together and then the mother leaves the infant for three minutes and comes back. And you see what happens. You see the infant's inner drama in the way they express their emotion. You see how she, the, the two interact, right? And how that creates a pattern that keeps going, right? And, and then feeds back into the emotion. Basically, both Bowlby and Rogers stayed in present process. They said, stay with your client, stay and see how the self is, it develops and is shaped in the interaction right in front of you in how they tell their story and in their emotional expressions and how they talk to you. Stay there, right? Stay in the present and look at the process. If you stay with process rather than always getting caught up in product and goal and controlling things and where you're going, you can't really get stuck. There's no stuck to the pros. So, you know, when a man in, in couples therapy says to me, um, well, I've just decided I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I've decided you're right, Sue. Um, I'm not going to really engage here with her. I'm, I've made a mistake. I fell in love with her. But basically, I decided a long time ago that the best way for me to live is um, I can numb out my emotions. I have ways of doing that. And, and the best way for me to live is never to let anyone ever get close enough to hurt me again, right? So from a couple's point of view, I'm stuck. It's a dead end, I'm down the rabbit hole. But if you stay with process, you're not. So you say, well, how does that feel for you? He says, it feels fine because that's what I decided a long time ago. I say, good, so could you turn to her please? And could you tell her? And notice how when I do it, I evoke the emotion and I order it. Could you tell her, please? I'm not going to let you in. I'm never going to let you in. I decided a long time ago, I'd rather live in this place called alone than ever let anyone, give anyone the chance to hurt me again. So I'm closing the door. I'm turning you down. I'm not going to let you in. I'm never going to let anyone in. I'm going to live my life alone. He's a lot of control, this guy. He goes bright red, says, do I have to say that? I say, no, of course not. I'm a therapist. <laughs> and he, I say, but you respect her. So you said you wanted to be honest with her. So he turns and tells her. Of course he turns and tells her and everything changes when he does. Because this time, you know, he hasn't, gone intellectual or fudged it or used a distraction or suppressed everything the emotions in the room he's feeling it he's present you stay with the process right and 
Um, the other issue is that both EFT and attachment, and to a certain extent Rogers, staying with that process, you're an empiricist. You stay with what's in front of your face. You know, you stay with what's going on in the room. You tune into the affect. You give primacy to the, 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 the affect cues and you stay with what's in front of your face. In a way, you stay with what attachment is about is in the end, it's all about biology. It's an organic way of seeing people. And for me, attachment helps us be on target and go into know what really matters and in an organic way that we're tuning into what people naturally do to deal with their emotions how they protect themselves from their emotions and then the protection becomes a prison where they can't shift where they can't get their emotional balance they can't engage with themselves and the world in a more flexible way so this is um, a biologically based approach to therapy as well so having said, and I'm running out of time, I knew I would, having said all that, um, we have, I hope, added to the attachment frame in our 30 years of working with couples. And just to give you a feel for that, uh, if you look at the new writings on EFT, what you'll see is we focus a lot on a, a macro intervention called the EFT Tango. And um, this comes from looking at thousands of tapes of therapists and thousands of tapes of sessions in our research studies and in our trainings and in our supervisions and me suddenly realizing you know like once you realize something it's obvious but until you do you know uh, realizing that good EFT therapists were always doing the same the same five moves so this gives you a feel of how practical the attachment frame can be especially when it's joined with you know you use those principles and you say experiential therapy fits with attachment perfectly how practical it is what does the eft therapist do all the time the eft therapist goes in in an open accessible and responsive way and tunes in to what's going on in the drama between people or in the drama inside somebody's head how they present themselves how they deal with their emotions you go in and you reflect present process. What happens to you as you tell me, you are not gonna accept this, you're gonna put your child up for adoption. I'm fine with it, I'm just fine with it. And I expect you don't think I should do that. And I say, ah, yes, I just stay there. So when you tell me I'm gonna give this baby up and when you tell me I'm gonna tell my husband, I don't care if we spit, I'm gonna give this baby up. What happens to you in your body? I don't know, I feel sick. Well, you feel sick. When you think about giving the baby up, what happens to you? And she starts to cry. All I did was stay there with her. Focus on present process. What happens to you when your partner turns and says, well, if something doesn't change, I'm out of here. Nothing, I'm fine, I've heard it before. You've heard it before? Nothing happens to you as your partner says, right? I'm out of here and I stay and I work with that. And what he says is, I just shut it down. I can't bear, I hear I'm the disappointment. I can't deal with it. I shut it down, I just shut it down. And if we were, if it, this was at home, I'd walk out of the house. And then you see that when he walks out, she says, there you are, he doesn't care. And the whole dance of distress is active in their relationship. You reflect present process. You know what to look for. You know what to look. You look for patterns of affect regulation and how they define the self and other. You look for patterns of interaction with attachment figures that defines the safety of somebody's world. So you focus one, move one in the tango, focus on present process. Move two, you go down underneath to the emotional music underneath the dance and you focus on emotion and you systematically help people assemble it, put it together from, the, from the, the main elements of emotion, the trigger, the basic perception, the body response, the meaning making, the action tendency. And if you come and learn EFT, you'll learn about all those until you don't wanna ever hear about them again. <laughs> You assemble emotion, you deepen it, you stay with it, you repeat. You know when you're on the money, so you stay there. 
you evoke it and order it at the same time. So you stay with the emotion, you get to the basic vulnerabilities, the basic fears, the basic needs, and that's where all these key messages come out. Somebody tells you, this is who I am. This is who I am. People don't say that until they tune into their emotion. And as you regulate their emotion with them, that emotion starts to get clearer and more easy to regulate. It starts to shift. You're in the emotional channel with somebody. That's move two. Move three, what do you do? You take that emotion and you turn it into a drama with a partner, with a, a, in the family, or with an individual, with one of the attachment figures we all carry around in our head, right? So you take the emotion and you enact it in a drama. You put it out into this emotional drama and you say, good, do you think you could, could um, let me see, I'm thinking of one of our training tapes in, in EFIT. We just put out two new training tapes in EFIT. One of them is with Travis. So I'll say, Travis, um, do you, can you see yourself as that little boy in bed who was crying and decided he was crazy and he was crazy and nobody understood the pain in his ears and in his head and his father told him, just man up and go to sleep and don't bother me. And you decided there's something wrong with me that I'm in this much pain. I'm crazy, I'm a bad kid. Can you see that little guy? And, he, and we've outlined all this, right? And he says, yes, I can see him. I say, good. So you told me a story the other day of how when your little boy was crying, you found yourself saying the same things to him as you did with, as your father said to you, and you corrected yourself and you went in and comforted him. So if you see that little piece of you right now, that little vulnerable piece, what would you say the strong Travis that is in this room with me talking right now so courageously at, about his emotions, what would you say to that little kid? Could you close your eyes and talk to that little kid? And Travis starts to be a secure, loving parent to his little vulnerable self. Huh? So, or in a couple situation, we'll say, could you turn and tell her, please? I do numb out, I do. I numb out because I'm so overwhelmed. I'm so scared, I'll never please you. So I freeze and I'm overwhelmed and I numb out and I turn away from you because I'm so scared. You take the emotional music, the new emotional music that you've expanded and regulated it, regulated, and you turn it into new messages and ways of engaging key people in this person's life or a key part of self, right? So you create an emotional drama. You enact people's inner reality into these relational dramas, right? That's move three. Move four, you process what just happened. Travis, what happens to you when you turn and close your eyes and comfort this little vulnerable part of you? And he weeps and he says he really needed comfort. I said, I understand. And he said, and you know, he never got it. I said, I understand. And he weeps and he says, I've spent so long deciding there was something wrong with me. And all I was was a little boy who needed comfort. And he grieves for that, right? Right? So we look at what's going on and we process what's happened. We process the drama. We help people take it in, make it coherent, regulate it, right? So all we say to a, a, a the partner in a couple therapy what happens to you when your partner says i do shut you out because i'm so afraid and she says i never knew that i never knew he was afraid i never understood he was afraid i did i thought he just didn't care and she turns and puts her hand on him and says i don't want you to be afraid this is a shift this lady came in amazingly angry ready to leave this guy the guy came in saying it was fine. He could have a divorce. He didn't care. <laughs> right? This is a huge shift. So you process the enactment. So reflect present process, but you know what to look for because you have a map. You know the variables that matter that define this person and define the way they interact with others. Reflect present process. Stay tuned in. Go into the emotion. Order it. Assemble it. 
you help people move into it so it's not alien and frightening anymore. You enact it, you create a drama with the emotion, either with a part of self or with another person. And in couples therapy with your partner, in family therapy with somebody in your family, right? You enact it. You process the enactment, the drama that's happened to make sense of it, to help people see it. And then number five, you celebrate what you just did, which is create a powerful moment of emotional change. And you can do this in every session. You, you celebrate it. And what I say to people in our sessions is, you don't celebrate it the way you do at work. You don't say, um, jolly good, you guys, that was jolly good. Well done. I can really see how hard you work. That's a waste of time. You celebrate and validate it in a way that helps people take it in. You do it in the way you talk to your dog. Huh? When my dog, when I see my dog, when I come home, I don't say, hi, dog. I don't. I say, hi. Oh, you're such a good boy. Oh, you're such a lovely dog. You're, love, you're the best dog in the whole world. Oh, yes, I love you. I love you. So the therapist says, look at what you just did. Now, this is not phony because we are empathically engaged and we do see the courage it takes, but we encapsulate it for people and put it up on the wall. Look at what you just did. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that different? Wow, you're courageous. And what do we do? We give people the message. You're competent. You can change your, the way you regulate your emotions. You can understand relationships. Relationships are understandable. They have a logic. You can understand them. You're competent. You're worthy. I see you as special. I see you as being able to deal with your problems. Your, prob your distress is manageable. This is what securely attached people believe. That's why they're so resilient. And you give people these moments at the end of the EFT tango. So what we understand from couples therapy is when we do the EFT tango and we create what we call hold me tight conversations between a couple, their sense of self changes, their attachment security changes, their intimacy changes, and the relationship patterns change, and they move into more secure attachment and um, marital satisfaction, and they're still there three, three years later which tells us that these hold me tight conversations are very powerful. And if you're interested in the effect on the brain, you can look at the, um, you can look at the brain scan study we did, which is all written up. You can find it on the ICEF site, um, www.iceeft.com. You can look at that study. Um, so, you know, we know that these conversations are powerful in couple therapy. And now we're doing a big study of EFIT, and we're going to create these change events in the EFT Tango. And I expect that we'll find the same thing. These corrective emotional experiences are going to have the same impact on people's depression, anxiety, the way they see themselves, et cetera, et cetera, and individual therapy. So just to say, I think attachment science and um, taking attachment science and seeing how it fits with an experiential humanistic therapy is absolutely the way forward for us in the field of psychotherapy. It's gold. So, you know, I can't resist just standing up and saying, hey guys, we found gold. Is anyone listening? <laughs> because, you know, uh, in the gold rush, it only took a few nuggets and everyone went looking. And sometimes I think in psychotherapy, we're all caught up in all our abstract ideas. Nobody's listening. But that's what I'm talking about. So maybe I'll stop and maybe you guys have some questions. Well, Sue, I think the best we can say here is just thank you so much for such a beautiful address. You're most welcome. It was fun. I don't really think we have a lot of time for questions and I don't really feel this is the place. I think um, those of us sitting here now who've had the pleasure of listening to you are um, very aware that you are giving us nuggets of gold. Yeah. And we thank you very much. You're most welcome. And I'm so happy to 